morning, happy, what is today, March 22nd. I'm Jamie with Stonemaier Games, and this is Biddy. Biddy is acting up right now. He's trying to be a little aggressive with Walter down there on the floor. So Biddy is going to hang out with us for a minute until he decides that he doesn't want to bother Walter anymore. Um, how are your pets doing today? Are they getting along? Are they behaving? Um, hopefully this little guy calms down in a minute. We'll give him a minute. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you today for the next hour to, as usual, sh share some Stonemaier Games news, although most of the fun news will come next week. That's our e-newsletter day, uh, March 29th. Um, but uh, yeah, they, I'll share some behind-the-scenes stuff today, discuss some random topics, various games I'm playing, things I'm watching, things I'm reading, stuff like that. And uh, we'll also... Yeah, well, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, any non-spoiler questions that you have in particular. Good morning, Chad and Rick. Thanks for thanks for popping in today. Uh, before I forget, I'll do, do today's like chocolate of the day. I am so I'm really excited. After this live cast, I am headed down to the co-working space that we've been using to play to learn and play the game Oath Sworn with my team, just to play it and learn from it. Hopefully, have a little fun with it. And I'm picking up lunch along the way, and I'm picking up some chocolate chip cookies as part of that lunch. So that'll be my treat of the day. Let me know what your treat or indulgence of the day is, if you have one. Uh, hey, Tony, good morning. So I've been, I'm curious, what have, uh, what have you read or watched or listened to recently that inspired you? That's my question of the day. Um, I have been working on... A somewhat tedious, but not uh, not bad. Just uh, a lot of repeated tasks. Element of a game that I'm that I'm working on, and I've been listening to um, some some public speakers. Oh, all right, Biddy, we'll let you down now. Be good. What, Biddy, he's he's immediately not being good. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to Megan at this point. Um, and while I'm working on this tedious task, I've been listening to uh, I listened to a long interview with Simon Sinek. Uh, a, a, a motivational speaker and author that I really admire. And also, I, I had never, I'd heard the name Brene Brown, but I hadn't listened to anything from her. And I've been listening to some of her talks too over the last couple of days. Yeah, really great stuff. So both of them are kind of inspiring me and giving me some good some good food for thought, maybe some fodder for the blog in the near future. But I'm curious, what, is, what has inspired you recently or who has inspired you recently? Um, whether it's a podcast, a video, uh, uh, something that you've played or read or watched, any, anything like that. See, Josh is joining us today. Tim, John, Tim, another Tim, oh, same Tim. Tim says, did you see the Kickstarter? Let's go to Japan. I don't know how I can't not back that. Yeah, I actually, I backed two Kickstarter projects this week. One was Let's Go to Japan. If you don't know, I, I studied abroad in Japan. I studied Japanese from seventh grade all the way through my senior year of college. And I studied abroad in Hiroshima and Kyoto. And this game takes place at least partially in Kyoto. And so I, I had to back it. Um, I backed it at the lower level. I rarely back the deluxe versions of games because I just want to play them and experience them. So I backed that, and I feel like I also backed something else. What else did I back? I also backed uh, Ecosfera, Rewilding the World. And I'm also backing, uh, personally, the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. Let's see what Ecosfera... Ecosfera intrigued me because it is a cooperative deck building game, and I think that's interesting. Um... I know there are other, other cooperative deck building games, but most of them are about like fighting something. And this game ha is about, uh, here they, they pitch it. Ecosphere is a cooperative deck building game where you need to restore nature before it's too late. Uh, I like that theme. I like that theme. So I'm backing that right now as well. Justin said that he's uh, tuning in real quick while his work is at a standstill. Steven's here as well. Um, so what have you been playing recently, if you're watching right now? I, over the last week, I played Age of Atlantis, the Age of Atlantis. I filmed a video about that yesterday. I played the Star Wars deck building game again with Megan. We switched roles, and Megan, of course, still beat me. She has won uh, both of our games now with uh, both the Rebels and the Empire. And I played Yokai Septet, uh, a partnership-driven trick-taking game. Played that for the first time, and I taught a friend, Pete, who loves trick-taking, taught him and played Skull King at game night last week as well. I think we also played 535. And at game night last week I played, or last night, I played the, the Quacks of Quinlanburg with all expansions. Posted some photos about that on Instagram. That was a lot of fun. This weekend also, the, uh, just a random fun thing that we did. 
I am part of a uh, some friends that have a cookbook club. So it's like a book club, but every month or every month or so they pick a cookbook and we each pick a recipe from that cookbook and make that recipe. And so we had one that was uh, a, a, a cookbook that was about woks, like cooking in woks. And so everyone brought a delicious dish, delicious dish this past weekend from a wok. And that was a lot of fun. That's a, that's a, a neat way to do a, a book club, I think, to everyone picks a, a recipe from the book. Nancy Jane Krista says she's been playing lots of Arc Nova and Wingspan. Those two go together well. Uh, Josh says, what's your thoughts on the Tabletop News Kickstarter? Um, I thought it was interesting. I, I, I love the idea. I love that they are striving to create a polished news platform for uh, tabletop news. Um, I can say at the same time that there's already some, some YouTube channels that I follow that I think do a pretty good job with that. And so I, I, I love the effort, I love the idea, and I'm sure they would do a great job with it, especially given the people that are, are, um, that are pursuing it. But at the same time, that itch for me is already being scratched by other platforms like uh, Roll for Crit has a good one, uh, Dice Breaker has a good one. And there's one more that I'm forgetting that I think has a really good one too. Maybe uh, it's not Critical Role, it's something else. But yeah, I, I love that they're going for something that they're, that they're passionate about. And Josh says he's been addicted to the Stuff of Legend. Can't wait for that game to come in. The graphic novels are very good. I'm not familiar with that game. What is the Stuff of Legend all about? Chad says he's been watching Bluey. He has a few little ones in the family, and he's discovered this cartoon. It's really amazing how they ease kids into deep and important subjects. Interesting. I don't have kids, um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with Bluey. Right now, we're watching the second season of Shadow and Bone, and we're watching Survivor, of course, and the new season of Ted Lasso, and I, and Shrink, or Shrinking, Shrinking, we're watching that as well. Justin's playing Fantasy Realms. Eric's playing. I won't mention what everyone's reading or playing, but I am reading it to see what, out of curiosity, what you all are playing right now. Uh, Nathan says, uh, "Greetings from Los Angeles. Did you by any chance watch Thinker Themer's recap of uh, the Dice Tower West convention? He said he said his game Motifs, the one he had playtested at Design Day. Oh, awesome. Okay, was reviewed by Maggie, and she had a high praise for it. That's awesome, Nathan. Congratulations. That's really awesome." Uh, they also enjoyed Mihir's new prototype, Raz, A Dance of Love. Just curious if you had happened to check it out. You know, I had seen that video pop up in my feed, and I hadn't watched it, but now I definitely will. Let me put that in my in my stream so I remember to actually watch that. Okay, yeah, 15 first impressions of games we played at Dice Tower West from Thinker Themer. I will definitely check that out, and congratulations again, Nathan. That's, that's really awesome. Um... Chad says his wife just started watching How I Met Your Mother based on a friend's recommendation. Super funny. It's great for binging too because there are a lot of seasons. Yeah, I had a lot of fun watching that back in the day when it was on. And now we're watching actually How I Met Your Father, uh, which is a pretty good follow-up, a pretty good sequel to, to that show. Uh, I'm reading, I'm actually, I'm, so I'm reading The Shadow and Bone, or I'm, I'm watching The Shadow and Bone season two, and from the same author, uh, Lee Bardugo, uh, hopefully I'm saying that right, amazing author. I'm reading uh, Hellbent, the second book, and perhaps the last book in a uh, slightly older age group, a, kind of an, a college age uh, book series that uh, that she put out a little while ago. A little darker, but uh, but I'm really enjoying that too. She's a fantastic author. My content recently, what did I do? I did a video this past week about different modes in games. So when you have one game and that game offers you multiple very distinct modes of play, and it isn't about player count scaling. It's about games like where you have a, a game has a competitive mode and a cooperative mode, or it has a one versus many mode, or it has a family mode versus an advanced mode. I talk about that uh, in this video. And it turned out to be a little bit more, um, maybe controversial is the right word, than, than I anticipated, because I am generally... I don't get excited when a game has multiple modes, um, but a lot of people in the comments seem to really appreciate that. Like my, my take on it, my, my general take on it is that I want a designer and a publisher to put out the very, to, to design from the ground up the very best version of the game and have that be the version of the game. And if they want to put like a little variant in the back saying, you know, if you want a little extra complexity, draft at the beginning of the game instead of not drafting, that sort of thing. Totally fine with that. But um, if I see a game has a lot of different modes, sometimes that could actually be a turn off for me because that, indicates maybe a little bit of, of dilution or that they, like, it, it's just exponentially more difficult to play test and really hone and craft 
entirely different games within the same box. And so if, I, if I'm in the mood to play a cooperative game, I'll pull a game that was designed from the ground up as a cooperative game in general, as opposed to a game that has a cooperative or a competitive mode in the box. With the one exception being expansions. Uh, because if an expansion is designed from the ground up to be cooperative for, say, a competitive game, like we did with Viticulture World, that to me signals that the, uh, that the expansion, that that was like the design intent for the expansion. So everything, all efforts and all playtesting and all design, all development went into focusing on that cooperative mode for a previously competitive game. So I'm fine for that. Um, it's fine with that. However, but like I'm saying, these are all my opinions, and I was surprised by how many people really did disagree with me. Like they, they have fairly strong opinions in the uh, in the converse. So it was a neat conversation to read um, and uh, to learn how other people feel about having different modes in games and how other people are genuinely sometimes using different modes. Because I think sometimes it's like a selling point. Oh, you got multiple modes in this game. That means you get more replayability or something. Uh, I thought it was just that. But a lot of people were saying they actively play both modes in a game and that like a family mode in a certain game has allowed them to play the game with other people that they wouldn't normally be able to play that game with. So anyway, interesting conversation on YouTube this past week. I also did blog post about um, about the One Ring. Um, Wizards of the Coast announced that they have a, a, in the Lord of the Rings set that they have coming out soon, they have a One Ring card and they have a bunch of different versions of this card. It'll be a, a very rare card, but it will be in normal packs of cards. But they'll also have a special version of the card that is one of one in the collector's edition packs. And I thought that was interesting, somewhat controversial as well, somewhat divisive, but interesting to see. And in that blog post, I revealed some other things. One specific thing that's somewhat related that we did for Stillmeyer Games in one of our games as well. So feel free to check out that article. And what was the last article? Oh, I wrote about Ted Lasso uh, and Ted Lasso his uh, just the enduring reminder of the power of kindness um, and the strength of kindness and the courage of kindness. And Ted Lasso is just a constant reminder of, of the, that, the power of kindness to me. And I, the first episode definitely hit home and inspired a blog post last Thursday about, about kindness. Anyway, I've been rambling on. Let me see what you all have been saying in the comments here. Um, Nancy Janes says that she expects to do poorly in the tournament for Unmatched, but she's hoping to have fun. I bet you will have fun, uh, Nancy Jane. I'm, I'm actually listening to a podcast with Rob Davio, one of the developers, maybe designer of Unmatched. Definitely the pub, I think one of the one of the publishers for Restoration Games. Um, he's talking about that on the Board Game Design or the Game Design Roundtable podcast. The new episode he's on that right now. Oh, and before I forget, actually, I am listening. If you are a Survivor fan like me, Jeff Probst has a fantastic new podcast about like behind the scenes stuff about Survivor. It's called um, On Fire with Jeff Probst. So if you like Survivor or if you just like behind the scenes stuff for any form of media that's created, it's pretty interesting to hear what goes on behind the scenes at Survivor. That's a great podcast that I've been listening to. Okay, Josh clarifies the stuff of legend is uh, a boy essentially gets kidnapped by the boogeyman into the dark. The toys come to life to go rescue him, but when they go into the dark, they become real versions of themselves. A fully cooperative game with a potential traitor. So I've heard of stuffed legends, but this sounds different, Josh. Is this a is this a, an RPG? Is it a board game? Is it a miniatures game? Tell me a little bit more about the, the game itself, although I appreciate you sharing the theme as well. Corey from Blue Falcon is in St. Thomas at the Meeples at Sea Cruise. Oh, you're quite far away, but joining us anyway from a cruise. I hope you're having a fun time there, Corey, uh, on the cruise ship. That's awesome. Nancy Jane mentioned that Canopy has a lot of modes. And Justin says um, he said that there won't be any more expansions for Tapestry, and it appears to be complete other than Civ adjustments. That's correct. Whenever we put out like a complete rulebook for a game, or in this case with Tapestry, we even have a complete insert, that's kind of a signal that we're very, very unlikely to make more stuff that like wouldn't fit into that insert or would clash with that complete rulebook. Justin says, what are your thoughts on the game as a whole and the legacy of the game in regards to Stillmeyer and the board game community as a whole? Um, from a publisher perspective, I am I am happy for any joy that this game has brought to people. It, it's brought me a lot of joy in being a part of the design and the development of the game. It's the Civ game that I always wanted to exist. Um, so it breaks my heart a little bit when someone says it isn't a Civ game because I designed it from the ground up to be like the Civ game that isn't tied to real world history. That's one where you could actually create your own civilization from the ground up over many eras. Um, 
so I, it's a game that I, I, I thought would take off more than it did. Um, and it, it, it has done well. It hasn't done uh, as well as I thought it would. But what really matters to me is that it has brought joy to some people. And I enjoy seeing people talk about the game and seeing the stories that they've made, the loopholes they've found, all the little little things they've done to find joy in Tapestry. And as a whole package of the core game and the three expansions, um, I think it comes together really well, especially for a game that, other than the Civ theme, it doesn't have a, a specific world. You are building the world every time you play. And I think that's pretty cool that we came up with a trilogy of, of expansions that offers so many different emergent narratives to come through the game, through the civs, through the capital cities, through the tapestries, through the tech cards, and the order in which you advance on the tracks. I'm, I'm really happy with what we created. Yeah. Tyler's popping in for the live cast. Uh, Tabletop Jable says, how do you feel about games coming out with different versions of itself? For example, Rogers of the Ganges and its roll and write version. You know, I was just looking at Rogers on my shelf today. I have the original Rogers on my shelf, but not the roll and write version. Um, I, I think it's in certain cases, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I, I think it's neat when a designer takes a game and up and it puts out a sequel for it. I have a whole video about sequels and my, my favorite sequels in games. Um, as long, I think the key though, is that it, I think it works best when, um, when both games can sit on the same shelf with each other and both games operate completely independently. So there might be some people that one version of the game is for and some people uh, the other game version of the game is for. And yet people who love one of the versions of the game feels like they have something unique and special in the other version of the game. I think that is tough to pull off. Um, but when it is pulled off, it's pretty special. Yeah. Uh, the closest comparison I think we have, I mean, we have the new edition of Between Two Cities, but that it really isn't a different version of the game in the way that you're describing. The closest I think that we probably have is uh, My Little Scythe, which is, you know, kind of a, a lighter family version of Scythe. And I, I think it does, like we wouldn't have published it. I wouldn't have published it if I didn't think it stood on its own um, independently and stood with Scythe as a companion to Scythe on the same shelf. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Any, uh, any examples of that where you have both games on your shelf and you're happy and excited to have both games on your shelf and you've actually played both on a semi-regular basis? Kevin says he's also enjoying the new Survivor podcast. Um, and Miles says the Ringer has a great Survivor podcast hosted by Tyson. The last had Jonathan from 42 as a guest and a great conversation. Highly recommend it. Thank you, Miles, for that recommendation. I will check that out. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what... Um, what Jonathan has to say. He was a fun contestant to watch. Here's the Jonathan making a comment here. Dif different Jonathan. He says uh, he's a huge fan of Tapestry and it's easily the most played game in his collection thanks to Board Game Arena and all the content you've added over the years. Thank you so much for creating this game. Thank you, Jonathan. That, that really does mean a lot to me. Um, yeah, I'm learning. Actually, I mentioned Brene Brown earlier. And Brene Brown has a great video about criticism and critics and uh, how it can be really healthy to figure out who the most important critics are in your life. And they aren't individual people for the most part, other than yourself. It's a, uh, the critics are uh, the idea of shame and scarcity and comparison. Those are like the big critics. And so Jonathan, I think of this because it brings me a lot of joy to see that the game has brought you joy. Um, uh, and uh, for those out there who also have constructive criticism about tapestry in our games, um, I want to be as open as possible to that too, so I can learn and grow as a designer and as a publisher. Tim says, he, he, I wasn't originally attracted to Civ games, so I didn't immediately pre-order Tapestry. Then the complaints about not a Civ game came in, and that intrigued me, so I bought it. It's so very good. Now that I have it, we play it so much. By the way, the insert is awesome, and I'm super happy you went that way. Yeah, it was the first time that we've, I think it's the first time that we've officially partnered with and really, like, uh, uh, collaborated with someone who's really good at making an insert. Although Game Trays, game trays we have done that too, but that, that was for inclusion in the game box itself. Folded space we worked together with. Uh, from the beginning for this insert. Although, again, they already had a version of the insert. We worked with them for the ver the third version or the, the second version of the insert that included all three expansions. But yeah, that was fun to do. Um, yeah. 
definitely fun to work with Folded Space. And I do appreciate, actually, for any of you who have the insert but haven't assembled it yet, Folded Space was very kind to put together two videos for the two different versions of the insert, both of which are in the same box. Um, one is if you have the third-party base snaps, the other is if you don't have those. Um, they've created two videos that's now on our website. So if you go to the Tapstry section of our website and look for the custom insert subpage, then you'll find the two videos there from Folded Space about how to assembly those uh, two different versions of the insert. Uh, Justin said, you know, Justin, your question about Tapestry definitely did not strike a nerve. I appreciate you asking about that. Um, he says, Tapestry is the game that got me into board games. That's wonderful, Justin. I truly love the Civ building element aspect and all my friends who have played it love it as well. Thanks, Justin, for saying that. And I, I hope you have a, a good day at work today. Tim says he got his first plate of Steam Up. I have Steam Up on my shelf too. My friend Miles, I think, has a copy as well, and he's already played it. I need to unwrap mine and check out these cool components because it looks beautiful on the back of the box. Zach says, is there a reason for the original wingspan and the expansions of the cover birds have had their wings open? And for the nesting box, I believe the only one on the outside of the box is the eagle, which is likely going to be seen the least since it's on the bottom of the box. Um, so Zach, no, there's no reason for that. There is a, like on the, the, the core boxes for wingspan, the, the cover bird, we like to have it be a, a bird with the wings spread to show off that bird's wingspan. For the nesting box, we kind of chose very distinctive birds for all seven continents. That was the goal there. Choose seven very distinctive birds, and they were birds that were already illustrated. So we weren't picking based on uh, whether the wings were spread or not. We were picking on how distinct they were for the continents. Yeah, that was the goal there. Chad says, what are your thoughts on the world building that companies like Garpale Games, Red Raven Games, and et cetera do? They have... They've had lots of success in designing multiple games that all live in the same world. I see you are dipping your toe into the 1920 plus world with expeditions, but is this something that you've considered expanding upon, perhaps with other Stillmire game worlds as well? Um, let me see. So I, I am pretty sure that I have a video about this, Chad. Not, not that I want to pass you off onto the video, but if you want to go deep into it, I would recommend checking it out. I'm trying to think of how I worded this video so I can search for it. I think it might be world. Let's, I'll search for the word world. Yes. Okay. I have a video called my top 10 favorite game worlds and series where I talk about this topic in detail. Um, I think it's awesome what other companies have done with that. For me in general, I am more excited to, to create and discover and explore different worlds for each game rather than repeatedly explore the same world. However, I think it's really great when other companies go deep into these worlds. Um, it's, it's fun to see what they do with it I, as, a, as a player and just as a, as a designer observing from afar. I think Red Raven in particular has done really well because they've really created this, um, or, or Ryan in particular has created this unique world that, uh, that I get to see different sides of every time I play one of his games. Um, I think the one challenge there that is a little difficult because Ryan is also the artist is that not all of his games are actually in the same world but they all look like they are because of the aesthetic of Ryan's art. And so that's a little bit of a challenge there, but he still pulls it off because he's, he's incredibly talented. Hopefully I answered that question, Chad. If not, feel free to follow up. I can, I can ask, I can answer more about that and check out the video. I just posted it in the comments here. If you want to check that out. Kevin is answering my question about games that, uh, that kind of sequels to games or different versions of games where both of them are on his shelf. And he says that Biblios and the Biblios Quill and Parchment are both played a lot with him and his groups. Nice. I've played Biblios Dice. I don't know if that's, I can't remember if that's the original Biblios or not. I think it is, but I haven't played Biblios Quill and Parchment. Okay, Josh has more details about the Stuff of Legend. Um, so, oh, okay, he clarifies. He says the Stuff of Legend is different than Stuffed Fables. I said Stuff Legend, sorry about that. He says, it's a board game created by Third World Studios. The team is able to take three actions before the enemy takes their turn. You move around the board, revealing locations, warding off enemy, enemies, trying to take the real exit out of, potential, out of a potential four of them. So a bit of deduction while trying to survive. It was Kickstarter last year and being delivered this month. It might be a game for Geekway plays in roughly an hour. Sounds awesome. I will dig deeper into that. And playing it at Geekway with you, Josh, would be really cool. Um, if I add it to my Geekway list. We'll see. I need to... I, I've been slowly putting together my Geekway list. The stuff of Legend. Okay, that does that does ring a bell. I'm seeing some previews here. I'll check out the Game Boy Geek preview later on today. 
Thank you for, for mentioning that. I'll, I'll definitely check it out. But yeah, I've been honing my Geekway, my games that I really want to play at Geekway for the first time list. And uh, it keeps growing longer, so I'll need to cut it down probably to like a, to 10 or so games. We'll see how I do with that. I'll push that closer to Geekway, a little bit closer to Geekway. Terry says that her spouse and her just started playing board games last fall. Welcome to the hobby, Terry. That's wonderful. We love Tapestry as a twosome and have all three expansions plus the insert. Great job. Thank you, Terry. And I'm, uh, that's awesome that you're, that you're into, uh, that you got into the game, the board game hobby. I, 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 hopefully you have felt welcomed. And um, if there's anything that we can do at Somewhere Games to make you feel more welcomed in the hobby, please let me know. Uh, that I, I want to try to remember every day that someone else is discovering our games or discovering the game hobby for the first time today, this hour, this minute. And uh, I want to make sure they feel welcomed and included into the hobby. Nathan's popping in to say hi today. Uh, Carol says that Stonemaier Vineyard shirt is still my favorite Stonemaier shirt. Yeah, well, it, this is like one of the few shirts that we authorize that we don't even make. This is a shirt made by Meeple Source. Um, they came up with it years ago. I really liked the design, so I said, you know, go for it. Even though it says our company name, giant on the on the cover of the shirt. Um, and fortunately, we're good friends with Meeple Source and uh, and partners with them in, in many ways. They sell a lot of the promos that we make. They're like the, the main retailer distributor that sells the promos that we make. So I'm happy for them to continue to make this shirt. Trishul says, what's the game accessory or expansion for which you got the most unexpectedly positive response? Hmm. I mean, our, our expansions have in general been received very positively. Uh, Tuscany is one that many people say that they, once they play Tuscany, they never go back to Viticulture. I go both ways because I like to share, I, when I'm introducing Viticulture to someone for the first time, I use Viticulture, I don't use Tuscany. Um, but Tuscany is universally well received. Actually, the Rise of Fenris, um, Ryan and I put a lot of time and effort in the Rise of Fenris. I was hoping people, it would be received well. Uh, I was a little nervous though, because it's not a legacy game, but it feels like it a little bit because you're opening up stuff, you're discovering stuff. There's a lot of discovery element to it. Um, I don't know why I was, I, I don't know, know if I was nervous about it because I knew how well Scythe would do, but I didn't know it would be quite as well received as, as it has. It's, you know, The Rise of Fenders has been incredibly well received by, by most people. Not everybody likes it. That's the same case for anything. But yeah, I was a little surprised by how well that was, that was received. Uh, Tony says he built his tapestry insert over the weekend and all along he kept thinking there's no way this is going to fit in the box and the lid closed. And he's happy to report that he was wrong. It's really amazing that all that stuff can fit into the original box. Ingenious. I agree. It's pretty amazing what Folded Space did with that, um, especially if you have the, the, the custom base snaps that third parties sell. But yeah, that was the goal. Fit everything in the box and they, they pulled it off. Carol says that she is still willing to bring Rurik to the Geekway uh, bring your work to Geekway if I want to play it. Yeah, Carol, I, I would still love to play Rurik. Um, and thank you for, for still offering to bring that. David says, are, are you backing any Kickstarters this month? Yes, the active Kickstarters that I'm backing right now. I don't think I'm backing anything on Backerkit or GameFound. I think it's just Kickstarter right now. I'm backing Let's Go to Japan. I'm backing Ecosfera, which is a, a, it's a E C O S F E R A. And I'm back in the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and I'm back in an age contrived, an age contrived, and I'm back in reviving Kathmandu. I think all those are still alive. Maybe the last two have have ended, but those are the ones I'm back in right now. Gamefound. Let's see if Gamefound makes it as easy for me to see which campaigns I am currently backing. I don't think it really does. Um, let's see my projects. Let's see if it easily shows what I'm currently backing. Filters. Um, yeah, okay, it does. I can filter it by, I think this is currently crowdfunding. Like, oh, you can even filter on GameFound by player count, by player time. So no, I'm not currently backing any projects that are live on, on GameFound. What are you all backing right now? What are you excited about? What, do you, what have you pre-ordered? What have you backed? I, what did I, I, I uh, pre-ordered Earth the other day after watching a wonderful review about Earth. And I started to see some people get their copies. I'm assuming backers will get their copies first and then us late pre-order customers will get theirs. But I'm really excited to get my copy of Earth. Um, I mentioned earlier in the in this live cast before many of you joined in that I am really excited to play Oathsworn today. So I, I've had that copy for a few weeks now, haven't played it yet. 
and I'm going to learn it and play it uh, right after this this uh, this live cast. So I'm I'm very curious and intrigued. It's one of the the highest rated games ever on Board Game Geek, um, and it is it's a style of game that I usually don't get all that excited about, but I'm so intrigued by by this game. Oathsworn, if you if you don't know, is a game about it's kind of split into a story portion of the game, very narrative driven. Uh, I assume there will be some puzzles to solve there, some some good decisions to make, more skill best skill test based, and then there's a boss battle, and that's the part that I don't normally do. I don't usually play games where you're just fighting stuff, but I've heard such wonderful things about the mechanisms around that boss battle, including the choice to be able to on any given uh, attack or test that you can use cards or dice. Um, I think that choice is really interesting. I'm going to try both today to see how they both feel, but yeah, I'm so curious, so interested to see how that that goes. I see my coworker and friend Susanna here is popping in from Asheville. She's visiting Asheville right now. And she says, the one highlight of my trip was visiting the old growth forest. Never logged, primordial feel, feeling, pure magic. That sounds amazing, Susanna. I want to go there. I want to go to Asheville. I've heard such amazing things, especially now that you've said that and that you're gonna, you've are gonna, been posting photos on Instagram, things like that. It looks amazing. I really want to go there and just have kind of a, a creative weekend or week like of hiking, of writing, of maybe some game design, some playtesting, just out in nature. Um, yeah, I, 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 somehow being surrounded by green gets my creative juices really, really flowing. And um, I'm, hopefully they're, they're inspiring some great thoughts and ideas from you as well, Susanna, while you're out there. Let's see, I've got to back up a little bit. Uh, that was Davis. Curtis says, you mentioned that you think the I split you choose mechanism is underused. Have you seen the great split? He's going to play it tomorrow at Game Night. I have seen it. It's odd. As, as excited as I get about the great about uh, I can't you choose, I don't buy or play every game that has that mechanism. Um, the great split is one that I'm I, I'm on the fence on. I, that's one I think it's on my Geekway list. Let me make sure it's on my Geekway list. If not, I'm going to add it to it. Is the great split on there? It isn't. I will add the great split to my Geekway list. I keep saying Geekway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a convention in St. Louis in mid-May every year, uh, where it's one of these conventions where you just come and play games for four days. There's a wonderful library, a wonderful play and win library as well. And it's a great place to just learn and try and play new games with friends and strangers alike. So that's why I'm adding it to this list as a game that I might want to try to play at Geekway this year. I am curious about it for sure. George says, um, Oh, he says, I'm one hour earlier uh, than usual. Uh, he says, tonight he has his first live game of complete tapestry, all the expansions with four players. I hope you have a lot of fun with that, George. And you're right. Yeah, I think parts of the world change their daylight saving at different times. And so right now it is 1030 a.m. here in St. Louis, but it might be a little off from what it usually is in other parts of the world. Tim says he's excited to get Final Girl Season 1 and Season 2. Should have that delivered today. Carol says that she just backed the Tiny Ninjas tournament version. She made a ti uh, made a dexterity version of Tiny Ninjas, and her son loves that game. That's awesome. Nancy Jane says that she loves the color of my my mug. Thank you. Yeah, this is a mug I believe from my childhood. It's one of those that has the little animals that peek out from the inside. What's the brand here? Creature Cups. Creature Cups. I get excited when the little animal peeks above the the uh, the coffee surface. Trevor just backed Final Strike on GameFound. What's Final Strike about, Trevor? I haven't heard of that one. Miles says that Earth has a beta version on Board Game Arena that he's excited to check out. I'm excited too, Miles, but I think since I have a copy coming, I, I rather would play it on the tabletop for the first time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go for that first. Maybe we can play that together sometime. Chad is really excited about Unconscious Mind. He has a Fox Experiment, Chicken, and Marvel United coming. I'm excited about Fox Experiment and Chicken. I, I backed both of those. I didn't know they were coming quite this soon. Now here's William. William, it's always good to hear from you. He says he's excited to order or pre-order Expeditions this week. William was a playtester for Expeditions. So I'm curious to see what you think of the final version, William. He says it will be the first game that he's ever pre-ordered, including Pledge or Back. I am honored by that, William. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I, 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 I really hope you enjoy the final version of the game and thank you for the positive impact you had on, on the game, along with all other playtesters who had a positive impact on it. Tim says, uh, do you ever drop by thrift shops and what sections do you hit? He says, I'm uh, into books and games and anything behind the counter first. 
You know, I haven't uh, I haven't checked out a thrift shop, a thrift shop in quite some time. So no, I, I haven't done that, but I probably should. I, I should check out every now and then to see what random books and games they have there. David's checking out, uh, we're talking about crowdfunding again. He's checking out Town, Town Folk Tussle, Point City, and Deep Dive. Both look good, but I'll be waiting for those to get to retail. AG seems to be making some great games lately. Yeah, AG, I, I, ever since they decided to um, streamline and cut down the number of games that they're published, the number of new games they publish every year to usually around three, I think they've really taken off. Uh, their, their games just seem really, really high quality ever since they started doing that. And they, they had great high quality games before, but that focus, I think, has, has really taken them to the next level. I really admire what they did with that. Lots of people, I won't read all these. A lot of people are waiting, uh, waiting for games that they're excited about. I see Darwin's Journey mentioned here. I'm excited about that as well. Marlene says that Tapestry is her current favorite game. Thank you, Marlene, for saying that. Uh, she says, my main problem with it is that I don't have enough people to play it with. I've noticed that those who, those I've seen who have expressed negative opinions come across as longtime gamers, the ones who think of themselves as experts. There's also a number of people who seem to initially dislike it, and then it grows on them. And finally, there are people like me who are re relatively new to the hobby who immediately enjoy it. You can't please everyone. Definitely true. Um, and I wonder if those who don't like it just happen to be the most vocal in the review spaces. Anyway, you've made a lot of people happy, so thank you. Thank you, Marlene. I really appreciate that. I think that kind of the sad thing with Tapestry a little bit is um, I think uh, for someone who, how do I say this? So I think some of those voices were pretty loud and I am not really not talking about specific people. This could just be random people on, on Tapestry and their opinions are valid. Everyone's opinion is valid. Uh, maybe not true, but if, <laughs> if there is a, a objective side to it, but um, but valid. And I think some of those voices, particularly about the balance of the game or that it's a Civ game that pretends to be a Civ game, but isn't really a Civ game, that opinion, I don't think is true. But I think that those are some people's impressions of Tapestry who haven't actually played Tapestry um, and maybe won't play because that's the only impression they have about the game. They heard someone say that one time and that's that's how, what they think about the game. And so I, I think there are probably more people out there that Tapestry could bring joy to their tabletop and, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of joy, um, but they haven't given it a try. And I think that's unfortunate because of those initial impressions that some people expressed. Uh, but I think that's, you know, there's so many games out there. And so sometimes you only have the ability to go by a few opinions and that will forever impact your impressions of the game. Like someone mentioned The Great Split earlier. I've only watched maybe two impression, two videos about The Great Split. I love I Cut You Choose, but those videos didn't really rave about the game. And so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll play another I Cut You Choose game. There are plenty of other games that I enjoy to play and enjoy, to, and enjoy playing. So um, I think that uh, that's kind of the danger of having so many great games or so many games that are great for someone that when I only hear a few impressions about a certain game that, that aren't people raving about it, then I'm probably going to turn towards another game instead, um, for better or for worse. Have any of you felt that same way? Do you, have you found yourself like getting intrigued by a game and hearing one or two impressions about it? And if they aren't right off the bat, if those impressions don't get you really, really excited about the game, that you kind of just forget about it and move on to something else? Or, or do you go pretty deep into a game before deciding whether or not, uh, whether or not it, is, it is actually for you? I do that for some games, but not all of them. Jeff is excited to get Earth and Revive to the table. Revive is on my Geekway list. I'm really in intrigued by Revive, but I haven't played that one yet. Trishul says, are there any plans, do I have any plans to revisit Japan? What would you like to do to explore when you when you go there? It's Sakura week right now in Japan. I would love to go back to Japan. Um, I'm torn a little bit because, you know, I have limited travel time as a human being. <laughs> and so if I'm going to go someplace, I am more inclined to visit a place that I've not already been. Uh, like Asheville that, that Susanna mentioned earlier. At the same time, Japan is so close to my heart. I mean, I, I fell in love with Japan at a very young age and it was a big part of my life for a long time. And so uh, I, I, I love it. I mean, I, I, I love Japan through and through and my language skills have dropped significantly because it's been 22 years, 20, 21 years since I've been to Japan, um, since I've used the language. I still have a little bit, but, and so the reason I'm torn is that Megan wants to go to Japan. I have friends who want to go to Japan. And so I would, I'm still inclined to go back if I can, I, I, because I love it so much. 
even at the sacrifice of not visiting someplace that I haven't been. So I do hope to go. I don't have plans. I don't have plans to go back, but uh, we have talked about it. And I, I think that at some point we will, we will go back there or I will go back there and Megan and some friends might go there for the first time. Chad says there's, there's a national park called Hartwick Pines here in Michigan. It's a forest that was never clear cut by the logging era, huge pine trees and trails. His wife and I go there every year. So tranquil. That sounds amazing. When I think of that too, Chad, I, there are some disc golf courses that are built into pine forests and we don't have any of those in St. Louis. Um, and so I'd love, and they look beautiful. These are beautiful courses. So I'd love to play disc golf in a pine forest sometime. Uh, I, I, there's something about it, something serene and beautiful. I, it really, uh, like you said, that's tranquil. It's a tranquil place. And I would love to play disc golf in a tranquil place because sometimes it can be kind of agonizing to miss, miss some putts that I shouldn't miss. Curtis says, would you consider more pre-order model approaches to future releases to help manage the demand for the game? I figured this would help some of the disappointment between print runs. It's something that we certainly think about, Curtis. Um, I would say it was a fairly easy decision to do for expeditions because it's tied to a known entity. It's tied to Psy, the game that people know. Uh, I am less inclined to do that for a game that people don't know, a brand new game, especially if we can't put out review content for that game yet because we're really asking people to buy fairly blind at that point. They can read the rule book, but they, they can't get that impression. They can't get those reviewer impressions of the game yet. So um, I... I I'm inclined to do it for, for known entities or like if we do a, a, a Wingspan spinoff someday, I'm inclined to do it for that. People know Wingspan, even if the, the spinoff is different, they know the core game of Wingspan. There's probably some connection there. I'm inclined to do it for something like that. But for a brand new game, I am less inclined to do it for that reason. I, I'm inclined to only do that when we can offer um, unbiased third-party reviewer content about, about that game. And that can't happen until we're at a certain point in the production process uh, because we, we need those those final production copies for reviewers to review the final production version of the game. So I think we're still doing the guessing game for those games and for, for spinoffs and sequels and things like that, we will we will use the pre-order system and expansions. I think we might do it a little bit more for expansions. We ha I haven't done that in a while. So for maybe for the next Wingspan expansion, we might do it that way um, because it's such a known entity at that point. Yeah. Trevor mentioned a game called Final Strike. He says, Final Strike is a deck builder-like game where you can upgrade cards mid-action to fight monsters and bosses. Very nostalgic pixel art. Trevor, can you share a link to that? I, I, you got me an upgrade and deck building, so I want to check that out. I think you said it was on GameFound, but I may have that wrong. So share a link if you don't mind in the comments here, and I'll, I want to check that out. Kevin just got his copy of Earth. I'm a little jealous of that. Let me see, before I finish on kind of questions here, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to cover today. Oh, stuff I stuff that I've been working on a lot is uh, I've been working on some game design. Also working on proofreading. We're at the proofreading stage for a, a project that we've been working on. So some intense proofreading, reviewing proofreader comments, things like that. And we also had a, a play test for a game that's being submitted to us that we're on the fence on. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat game. A little on, on the fence ab about it. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what comes of that game. So we had a play test of that the other day. And also just on a personal level, watching a lot of disc golf this past weekend. There was a, a disc golf tournament this past weekend, so we watched a lot of disc golf. Trishul says, what was your experience porting Wingspan or Tapestry for Board Game Arena? What would you like to see change on the platform? So I'm very separated from that process. It's really us just saying, giving the, the files to Board Game Arena. Um, well, first, we're getting the permission from the digital developers. That's important. Um, particularly for Wingspan, because Monster Couch has put a lot into that digital version. Then we send the files, we see if there's interest from Board Game Arena, if they can find a developer who is interested within their team of volunteer or paid, develop, uh, paid developers, if they find one, then we send them the source files and they take it from there. Um, there is a little bit of involvement from us once they get to like the alpha beta testing stage, but it's really separate, they handle everything. It's, it's their, it's their uh, product at that point. Um, so we're, we're licensing it to them for them to create. What would I like to see change on the platform for Board Game Arena? I don't know. I'm, pr I'm pr pretty happy with the, the way Board Game Arena works right now. So I don't think I have anything. I don't think anything comes to mind that I that I want to change on the platform. Yeah. In fact, I'm, tonight is my my virtual game night. I have a virtual game night every other Wednesday, and we 
by default, always play on Board Game Arena and have a blast doing so. So we're going to be playing something there tonight. What have you all been enjoying on Board Game Arena recently? If there's a game there that you've really been enjoying, maybe we'll check it out tonight. Chad says, okay, so I like this. Uh, Chad says, over time, I found certain reviewers that share his his same taste in games. He says, I then know if I will be more inclined to like a new game or not. Doing that has served me really well. I definitely found that, Chad. Uh, there are some reviewers that have similar taste to me. I use those reviewers, I go to those reviewers as a gamer to decide what games are a good fit for me. Um, and also, I tend to gravitate towards reviewers who aren't necessarily positive, but who at least don't do kind of clickbaity stuff and don't have videos. Like if a reviewer does a video about like the 10 games I, I hate or 10 things I hate about games or 10 games that I'm, I'm getting rid of, things like that, that's a big turnoff for me as a reviewer. I mean, that, or as, as, not as a reviewer, as, as a gamer who's wanting to learn about games. Like I, I, I don't need someone to focus on the positive. For sure, I don't need that. But I also don't need someone to, um, to commoditize negativity. That to me seems, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it seems. It just isn't a good fit for me. That isn't the type of, that isn't how I want to spend my, my time, uh, my energy when I'm, when I'm consuming content online and when I'm learning about games. Um, yeah. So those are the types of reviewers that I go back to over and over again, the ones that, uh, that don't have those types of videos. Josh says that he loved his time in Japan and he wants to go back so bad. Where were you in Japan, Josh? You may have told me that, but uh, yeah, let me know where, where, where you were. Mark says that he and his wife are going to Japan at the end of this month. It will be his first time and will be there for 16 days. That's awesome, Mark. I'm glad you're able to go for a significant amount of time. Where are you planning to, to hang out while you're, while you're there? Curtis says he finds the greatest challenge with gaming is balancing old favorites with experiencing new games. Do you struggle with this balance to ensure that you play new games you enjoy? Uh, new games might enhance an older implementation of a mechanism or offer something that you've not before. Yeah, I, mean, I do. I, I would say I have a pretty good mix because I definitely gravitate towards old favorites. I, I bring those to game nights. I, 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 I want to get those to the table, uh, games that I already know, that I already know that I love. But I also, on a regular basis, pretty much a weekly basis, I try to get at least one new game to the table. Because partially because I have a YouTube channel where I talk about mechanisms and games, I, I like to to talk about those games, whether they're they're newer or older games, as long as they're new to me, um, I want to learn from them. But also, I never know when I'm going to discover my next favorite game, and I, I can't do that unless I'm playing games that are that are new to me. Gerald says I'm thinking of buying Skull King because of your video. Do you enjoy it with the included modules and play all ten rounds? I do play all ten rounds. Uh, the only module that I haven't played is uh, the one where the pirate, each pirate has a unique ability. Um, if that if they were printed on the cards themselves, I might play with, play with that module, but they aren't printed on the cards, and so I, I don't play with that module. And I still have a, a, a ton of fun with it. Ivan says, have you played Distilled? No, I've, I've talked to the designer of Distilled. I think I've met the designer of Distilled. Um, I've played a little bit of the prototype when it was on Tabletopia. Um, but I haven't played the final version. He says, it is a game about making alcohol with an interesting game mechanism, which goes well with a theme. Yeah, I need to play the final version. I definitely need to check that out. I, I've seen that on the hotness recently. So it sounds like people are having fun with it. Thank you, Trevor, for sharing that link to Final Strike. I will check that out. Looks like it's struggling a little bit, so but that's okay. Um, yeah, I'll check it out. Thank you for the recommendation. Josh has headed off in a few minutes. But he wanted to mention what I said in the Tapestry Facebook group recently. He said, I picked up the Charterstone Recharge Pack, but was disappointed that it arrived in a clear plastic Ziploc bag and spoiled some components for me. I've only just started my first campaign. Ah, I see. Um, that is good feedback, Joshua. Thank you for letting me know about that. You are right. Yeah, we did very minimal packaging for the Charterstone, the latest version of the Charterstone re Recharge Pack, because the box just seemed extreme. But what we probably should have done is used an opaque bag. So I guess it's a word to the wise. If you are getting the Charterstone Recharge Pack and you have not actually played Charterstone yet, be real careful. Don't don't look at that pack. Um, just kind of tuck it away as soon as you receive it. And Joshua, I'm sorry that was your your experience with Charterstone. Fortunately, there's a ton of stuff that you have not spoiled by seeing maybe a few little things in that pack. But um, but I'm I'm sorry you that that pack spoiled a little bit for you.
Um, and it sounds, sounds like Joshua, you posted that in the Tapestry Facebook group, but not the Charterstone Facebook group. Um, so maybe maybe that was a typo, but that, that sounds like that that um, belongs in the, in the Charterstone group. Sam, who I just got to talk to yesterday, I had a wonderful conversation yesterday with Sam, Sam McDavid here. Um, Sam invited me to have a conversation with him on my, uh, my YouTube channel, where we just had a, a conversation about game design. He asked me seven questions. I asked him a few questions and we recorded it. And so that'll go live sometime in April, where we just had a conversation about content creation, about game design, a lot of different topics. And I uh, thank you, Sam, for popping in today to say hi. He's, he says he's curious about Steam Up when I get that to the table. David says, uh, how do you decide you are finished designing a game and move on to production? Do you have a set of criteria it has to meet? Actually, this is something that Sam and I talked about yesterday. Yeah, the very short answer to that question is part of it is gut feeling. When I when I am have played the game a lot, when I when I feel like the game is at the right place, but also when I am getting reports from blind playtesters that the game is rating uh, at least an eight, a nine, or a ten for all playtests, where it's no longer being rated lower than that, which it usually is in the initial waves of blind play testing. So I'm looking for those those scores to be up and to stay up really high, close to 10, as close to 10 as possible. And that's a signal to me that the game is in a really good place. We're also doing data a uh, analysis to make sure that uh, the game is as balanced as possible, all that sort of stuff. So part of it is data-driven and part of it is gut feeling. It's a combination of the two. Marlene says that she really likes watching Rodney's how to play videos uh, and uh, and play, she says playthroughs can be helpful, but also too long sometimes. One format that I really like uh, that I've seen on a few different places, including the Board Game Revolution channel, and I've recently seen uh, Tabletop Tolson do it, either on her channel or on Rado's network. Um, but I like seeing a few turns of a game. I don't need to see a full playthrough, but if I can see, watch a few turns be played, that to me gives me a great taste for a game. Um, and you're right, Roddy, I think, also does a wonderful job at his rule replacement videos that give you a pretty distinctive feel, or they let you know exactly everything that you need to know to learn a game. Roddy is actually working on expeditions right now. So I'm excited to see what he what he does with that video. He asked me some rules questions uh, just yesterday that I, that I got back to him about. Jerry says, did you get to play around with chat GPT AI yet? If so, do you see any value for it in your game design work? You know, Jerry, I'm, honestly, I'm kind of staying away from the AI stuff. Um, so no, I haven't played around with it, uh, and maybe there's value, but, uh, and maybe I'm missing out on the future, but I'm going to stick to, to working with humans. I think Joshua said that he posted in the tapestry Facebook group because he got it in the same package as, uh, as tapestry. That makes sense. Uh, word of the wise. I, I, I doubt most people who are ordering tapestry are also ordering a charters to recharge back, but I, I can see what you're going for there, Joshua. Charles says, when you decide when do you decide to rate a game on board game geek um after one play after a few i usually rate it i usually rate games after my first play i do um i, I can generally have a pretty strong impression of how i feel about a game after that first play i do though however try to remind myself that if i have a different impression of a game later that i it's a reminder to me that i need to i need, I need to remind myself to go update my rating but yeah i generally update i, I generally uh post my my rating for the game after I play it. That's one of the ways that I actually track that I've even played games in the first place, if I've rated it or not. What about you, uh, Charles, and anyone else who's following along here? When do you rate board games on Board Game Geek, if at all? Um, do you rate it after one play, after multiple plays? Hopefully you don't rate it before you started playing the game, which is a huge pet peeve of mine for, for Board Game Geek. All people who do have the right to do that, I would really appreciate people not to, not to rate a game until they've actually played it. After that, rate it for whatever reason you want. You don't like the designer, you don't like the publisher, go for it. But play the game first. It's like rating a movie that you haven't watched. Like how, how do you know if you actually like the movie or not? Curtis says, is there any concern that the price of games are becoming unaffordable? He says, $100 in uh, Canadian dollars for a game is fairly common, and any large Kickstarter seems to be in the $200 range. Something so refreshing about a $30 to $40 game that looks beautiful and is compelling. When you ex expose a friend to a game and they love it, and it's a bit difficult to say that it only costs or that it costs $120. Um, Curtis, yeah, I, I hear you. I absolutely hear you. Yeah, it, and I think I really like that you brought in the, the recommending factor. Like you play, you show it, you're so excited about a game that you bought, you show it to a friend, and then do you almost feel guilty when you're like, if that friend loves it, that you're like, oh, well, you can get this game, but it's $150. Um, 
opposed to a game being $20, $30, $40. So Curtis, this is something that we look at constantly. I've been, I am always concerned about the price of our games. I think a lot about price and we have lots of almost heated discussions internally about price between me and, uh, and my team uh, because we're all pulling from different perspectives. They're looking at it from the retail perspective, the distributor perspective, the, the localization part of perspective. I'm looking at it mostly from the direct to consumer perspective. And I think it helps us at least a little bit that we have the champion program. So we can offer discounted prices on our website and champions also get a 20% discount on that price. So we can still meet our margins and be sustainable in terms of profit margins and, and the ability to reprint games, to have enough profit to reprint games um, and to sustain my staff, things like that. But also offer people a really, really good discount on games um, if they are a champion in particular. So it's something that's always on my mind for sure. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of the games that we have coming out in the next year and uh, thinking about their prices. And, and I don't know if we have one in the 30 to $40 range. Maybe we do, but, uh, but right on the border there. But yeah, it is something that I think about a lot. And I, I really, again, like the example of showing that game to a friend and how accessible is that game going to be price-wise to someone, especially if they're a new gamer. If they're new to gaming and you show them your favorite game, if that game is a $150 game versus a $30 game, they're they're more likely to I think enter the hobby in that thirty dollar game than that one hundred fifty dollar game, maybe. Um, Chad says, as an artist and designer, thank you for keeping with the humans for artwork for sure. It's a genuinely scary time for artists right now. Yeah, I, I can imagine that for sure. Gerald says, do you did you ever find someone to teach you the games that you buy and do you enjoy gaming now more that you are unburdened from rule books? To a certain extent, yeah. Um, it's certainly like Oathsworn. Oathsworn sat on my shelf for weeks. I was super excited about Oathsworn, but I was not excited about learning Oathsworn uh, from the rulebook. And so I really appreciate that I have a, a friend who's willing to do that. And I, I compensate them for their time because it, re it really is a, something um, that they're doing uh, as, a, as a professional favor, essentially, for, for me and for Stonemaier Games to do that. Yeah. People were answering about when they rate games. So Charles rates game after his first play. He can change that uh, rating after his opinion, if his opinion changes. Damien says that if he gets a good enough of a feel on, a, on the first play, he'll rate it after the first play. But sometimes he'll wait until he plays it a few times. I can definitely, I can relate to that, Damien. Yeah, sometimes uh, I'm not entirely sure after that first play, as important as that first play is. And Gerald says something similar. He says that if he doesn't love a game, he might give it another a couple tries before he rates it. That's very generous of you, Gerald. And Curtis points out also, Curtis, back to Curtis's point about uh, game pricing. He says, uh, 20 to $30 game, you can consider gifting it. It's a lot harder to gift a game that costs $150. Absolutely. Definitely. So, yeah, especially if it's like that game that you have at that moment where you, if, if you spent $30 on it, you might be like, okay, you had fun with it? It's yours. Take it. Welcome to the hobby. <laughs> here's, here's a copy of the game. But if it's a $150 game, you're probably a little less likely to do that. It's generous of you, Curtis, to even think of doing that, though. I think that's really wonderful. All right, I probably need to tie up so I can actually go play this Oath Sworn game that I've been talking about. Um, thank you all for joining me today for asking these wonderful questions and sharing your answers too. I always really appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for our April Fool's, our early April Fool's celebration next Wednesday, March 29th. I'll see you then. Um, all right, take care, everybody. See ya. Bye.